You know, we spoke on the foundations of what union in uh, Christ means over the past several weeks. And last week, we began to see how can this be applied practically to our day-to-day lives. And we spoke on the foundations of faith and repentance as two things that are necessary for our walk on a continuous basis. Today, we want to go a little more practical to see what are some very practical ways, things that we can do to experience this union. Now, I was visiting a friend recently, and this is a conversation I've had with several people where uh, when some big Christian leaders fall, the impact it can have on us is terrible. And I've shared the statistic, too, from my seminary prof at Fuller, Dr. Bobby Clinton, who has studied thousands of leaders, both in the Bible and outside and contemporary leaders, that three or four, three out of four leaders do not finish well. And there are seven barriers, typically, that exist to which they succumb to. And one of the things he highlights is... It doesn't happen all of a sudden. You know, when a leader, or whether it, or even you or me, when we fall in our spiritual walk in a significant way, it doesn't happen overnight. And he actually goes on to suggest five things that we can do to overcome those spiritual barriers, and one of them is tied to practically experiencing our union with Christ through spiritual disciplines. And you can very clearly see that the day you stop being consistent in those spiritual disciplines, our downward spiral has already begun and it is just a matter of time before we can tip and fall. And so today I'm going to try, I'm I'm not going to talk about something exotic today. I think every now and then, we need a reminder of some of the basics of our normal Christian life. And today, that is what we are going to look at from the perspective of how we don't do them for their sake, but do them to experience more of our union with Christ. You know, every time I call the doctor if I have some illness or You know, I get sick. Before I can talk to the doctor, there is a nurse that asks me some basic questions. And I'm sure you have had that too. Do you drink or smoke? Do you exercise? How long do you exercise or work out and how many times? And sometimes there are some strict nurses who even ask if I eat my veggies. You know, if we want to live a healthy life, we know that we need these basic practices. These are nothing fancy or exotic, but basic life-giving practices. You know, I really don't like eating my veggies still, but I still need to eat them. I don't like to push my body to go for a run, but I know if I stop running... I'll become diabetic in less than two weeks because of a genetic disposition I have. So these normal, non-glamorous, unseen habits have helped me stay healthy at least until now in my life. You know, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And you know, that brings us to tie the question for today. What are some means of experiencing godliness through our union with Christ? And the answer is simple. Just like we have physical disciplines to take care of our physical body, God has given us spiritual disciplines to take care of of our spiritual lives. You know, one of the first books I read almost 20 years ago and still resonates with me is a book called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Just the very title baffled me. 
how can a discipline be celebrated? Those are totally opposites. Because all these things sound very hard, very difficult to do. But here was Richard Foster saying, oh, you can actually celebrate it. And here is this quote. It says, God has given us the disciplines of the spiritual life as a means of receiving his grace. The disciplines allow us to place ourselves before God so that he can transform us. You know, just like I spoke about the kite. You know, the kite needs to be placed in the direction of the wind so the wind can then take it and take off. But if you're just doing these for their sakes alone, they can be tiring and mechanical. But when we are able to see that these are means through which I can experience Christ and seek Christ through these, it can become life-giving. And especially in the season of Lent, there is no better time to indulge more in these than before. So I want to go over these basics. We all have heard a zillion times, but it does help to read it and hear, hear it again in the context of our union with Christ. First is God's word, the word of God. Now, there are these five basic principles or, or disciplines. God's word, prayer, worship, community, and consistency. And we are going to go through them in the same order. Meditating God's word. Union with Christ transforms how we read the Bible. You know, Psalm 1 begins by saying, Blessed is the man who meditates on God's word day and night who does not walk according to the counsel of the wicked. So for a man to be blessed, God's word has to be central. But it's not just simply reading the Bible for reading's sake. You know, John Jefferson David has this thing to say. He says, the reader of the Bible comes to the text, not as a stranger to Christ, who is the central subject of all scripture, but as one who is actually connected to Christ by the Holy Spirit, as one who was really in the re real presence of the risen Lord in the prayerful reading of Scripture. Meditating on Scripture can and should be a real-time experience of communion with the living Christ. If we don't read the Bible without this perspective, that when we read the written word of God, Christ, the incarnate word of God who is in us, through his spirit, is connecting us to the written word, then the whole Bible reading can become a chore. And so do we approach the Bible with the expectation that the same spirit who inspired these words Long ago is the same spirit who is in you and me speaking to us, making these words come alive. Which is why in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 it says the Bible, or God's word, is living and active. The only book where the author is alive and is in us. You know, I've shared this before as well. My Hebrew prof would tell us. That once we learn Hebrew and think we know how to read the Bible. And he would say, read the Bible until something happens to you. That's when you know you have read enough. And that something is finding Christ in that scripture. And letting Christ in us connect our heart and our soul and our spirit to that centrality of Christ that we see in the word of God. So we need to read the Bible until we can find Christ and connect with him. You know, when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus with those two disciples, he was expounding the scripture. And later on, in verse 32 in Luke, this is what they say. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us 
while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures, where Jesus was opening the scriptures and showing to them how from the law and the prophets, all the things were pointing to him. And it said their hearts were burning. That should be our experience. If that is our experience when we go to God's word, we are going to love spending time in his word. Most of the time reading the Bible becomes a chore or difficult because we don't know how to read the Bible. We may pick a read the Bible in a year plan or a chronological reading plan and we can have all of that. But if we don't know to find Christ in scripture, we are going to lose it all. And that's what we are doing in our midweek devotional. And this week, Wednesday, I'd love for you to join me. I'm going to speak to you about nine ways in which you can find Christ in all of Scripture. And it's, it's something that helps us in a very fresh, personalized way, not intellectually or academically, you don't need 10 commentaries and need to know Greek and Hebrew, although they are wonderful and significant and important. But there are some very simple ways that you can use to find Christ in Scripture. So that whatever book you are reading, you can connect with Him. And He's going to speak to you. And we're going to need that every day, friends. We're going to need that. Second thing, second basic spiritual discipline is prayer. You know, Mother Teresa has said once, we learned to, we learned to pray by praying. It's hard and difficult. But we're all so busy. Sometimes our prayer feels inefficient. Sometimes we don't even believe, oh, God actually can answer my prayer for some things. Sometimes we have so many questions. Does my prayer make a difference? Won't God do anyway what he wants to do? For some of us, we have been disappointed with prayer. We know we've been praying fervently for something. Something that's sim that we are struggling with, wrestling with, a health crisis, relationship crisis, reconciliation, forgiveness, whatever. It doesn't happen. And then we are like, why should I keep praying still? You know, Oswald Chambers once said, The greatest enemy of the life of faith in God is not sin, but good choices which are not quite good enough. The good is always the enemy of the best. You know, because God is better than anything we could be asking for, even better than life itself, the call to persist in prayer is not for God's sake, but for our sake. To train and purify our desires. Because prayer is integral to abiding in Christ. Because the real point of prayer is not something, but someone. And just as how union with Christ changes how we read the Bible, it also changes how we pray. You know, this is our comfort because God, one of the authors says this, this is our comfort because God answers every prayer for either he gives what we pray for or something far better. How many times we have been thankful that God did not give us what we asked for because if we had gotten that in hindsight, our lives would not be what it is today. But he gave us something better. And the real reward of prayer is not what we are asking God for. The real reward of prayer is communion with God. Which is made possible by our union with Christ. Now, this is the reason we have periodically fasting prayer in our church. Because sometimes our prayer lives can be up and down. And it's, these are times where we can get together and have that reinvigorated. And we are going to have another fasting prayer. The end of March. You'll hear more about that. We did this 12 hour fasting prayer last year. And that was such a blessing. Because we were praying most of the time for others. And the world and those who were hurting. 
And it was so encouraging. And this time, I want to encourage you to join us again. And we are going to try and use the time of fasting and prayer to connect with Christ in a very deep way. You know, prayer takes away all our burdens, clears all our doubts. You know, when we have conflicts with others, or when we go through difficult times, we end up doing a lot of self-talk to ourselves. We end up a lot of times going into conspiracy theories in our mind. Oh, I know why that person said this and why that person did not say this. Or I think they are going around doing this when all we need to do is go to God in prayer and give it all to God. As the song says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and sorrows bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. And when we connect with Christ within us, to lift our prayers to God's presence where he is seated on his right hand as our sympathetic high priest, when we pray with that understanding of that union with him, several things happen. He clears the doubts in our minds or acceptance Am I good enough to go before God's side? Am I good enough in people's eyes? You're going to say, no, you're incredibly loved because you're being, you're being clothed with my righteousness. Or when I go, if when I have struggled with sin and fallen in temptation and seek help, he's our sympathetic high priest who will welcome us, offer us forgiveness, lift up our spirits, And all those blessings of our union with Christ flow in that moment of prayer. That's when they all come into union with all of our senses. And it is when we pray, His Holy Spirit convicts us, encourages us, edifies us, reminds us of who we are. That's the second spiritual discipline that we all need. For the union with Christ to sink into our hearts and our lives. Third is worship. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 and 25. It says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. No other time is a good time to think about this verse than now where due to the pandemic we have been forced to not be able to meet together. And we need to realize this digital way is not how God envisioned worship to be. There is a blessing of coming together and worshiping. I'm going to unpack that for us. And I know several of us have gotten very comfortable with worship on demand and maybe are not participating right now because it just feels hard. And I get it. It is hard to just tune in by yourself every week and, and know, is that, am I even connected? Is anybody else worshiping with me? But trust me, union with Christ changes how we worship. You know, Jesus Christ is called the body of Christ. And when we gather physically as a church together, all of us have Christ in us and we use that to serve one another. And all elements of worship are supposed to help us to experience Christ's presence. Singing, praying, reading, preaching God's word. When all this happens, Christ who is in each of us, comes alive as we all use our gifts together and Christ's presence can literally be experienced collectively. So when you do come to those moments, God willing, when we do it soon, instead of passively observing, we can ask, God, what do you want to do in me now? What do you want me to hear? How do you want my life to look different 
know, some days we may come to worship full of doubts and fears, not really trusting that God is good or that we are loved. But when we hear the voice of a person next to us singing of God's goodness, and not to mention being in a room full of people singing and praising God, it strengthens our faith beyond what we can understand. And it's not just that. In addition, because God knows our faith is weak, He has given us pictures to remind us of the gospel, which are called the sacraments, especially of baptism and Lord's Supper. And exactly what do these two sacraments talk about our union with Christ? Because sacraments, those of you who have been to this communion preparation class with me, this is another quiz for, for you. What is the definition of sacraments? You can text it to me if you remember it. Sacraments are God-given worship experiences for us to make our union become true. They are visible signs of an invisible reality. When we take the bread and wine, they represent the presence, the real presence, the real spiritual presence of Christ. They make us experience our union with Christ's death on the cross through which the forgiveness he purchased for us becomes real to us and sealed in a big way. And in the early church, if you read in the book of Acts, they were doing this every day because we need these reminders every day. And friends, I can't wait for us to gather together and experience those wonderful moments. We're going to flash that poll now, you know, again, as we are planning for this regathering. We're going to have 60 seconds to fill this if you have not already done that. So it will help us to see if you are ready to join us as well. And we are going to try and follow all CDC guidelines and protocols that the county has established to make it a safe experience for us, but also where we can come and experience all these aspects of worship that we have been experiencing isolated in our own homes together after a long time. And we truly hope when we do that, and as we start getting back into it, it will really be a blessing to encourage and lift up our spirits. Fourth, what we are going to look at is community. Union with Christ not only means we are united to Christ, but we are united to one another. That's a big, big implication of that union. Christianity is not an individualistic religion. Christianity is not about me and my walk with God alone. Christianity is not where I can just lock myself up in my house and just hear some bunch of sermons and read the Bible and become holy by myself. Never happens that way. That's not how it was designed. It is supposed to be happening in authentic community. And why is that? Why is that? And what is the model for that? The ultimate model for that exists within the Trinity itself. You know, there are several verses in the Bible. We don't have time to go into it. That can be a series in and of itself. And I hope to touch that at some point. Where the Father is fully present in the Son. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And the Son is fully present in the Father. And when Jesus came on earth and the Holy Spirit descended on him, the Holy Spirit encompassed completely all of Christ. So you see, each member of the Trinity is fully in communion with the other. And there exists no space where any of them are not in communion. 
And so when we are created in that image, God is expecting us, because we have the same Christ and the Spirit within us, to have that same union of not being a space where we are isolated or separated or broken. That's the theology of community. We're not saying that just because it's cool and hep or you have shared interests or we are on the same life situations. No, that's the theology of community flowing straight from the Trinity. And that's what the union in Christ is supposed to accomplish. You know, community living is a deep sharing of our lives so that Christ in each one of us can encourage, exhort, and edify each other. And you and I need this because we can't always be on a spiritual high. There are times and moments when we may feel disconnected from Christ. And when this happens... We are in a dangerous zone, as Christ says, without me you can do nothing and we will be fruitless. And if you keep continuing down that path is when you're going to end up falling in a big way like these leaders do. You know, I've read several articles on people writing about after leaders fall and how you need to have accountability structures and how, you know, you have to have X, Y, Z and as important and significant as they are, nothing replaces our daily walk with Christ and having a friend to whom we have given permission to look into our hearts and come alongside us and do life together with. If you do not have a friend like that right now, my dear friends, who can, with whom you can be completely vulnerable, with whom you can go and say if you failed and messed up or if you're feeling disconnected from Christ, hey buddy, I'm not doing well, or I messed up. And if that friend is not able to lift you up and bring you up and restore you, or if you're afraid that if I do, I am going to be judged, or this will be a gossip, and therefore I'm not going to do, you're in a dangerous territory, my friend. Or if I say things and it will hurt the other person and therefore I don't want to confront them or share with them because it's a risky business, then that's not authentic community. We need someone to come into our lives to reveal our blind spots to us and also to fill us with what we lack. See, fellowship is not just getting together and watching games or movies or talking superficial stuff without really making one another uncomfortable. But it is really getting deep to be able to share our brokenness in our lives and let each other minister to us. And every Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him or her. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged. These are the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. That's what Bonhoeffer said as the reason for community. James chapter 5 verse 16 reminds us that we need community to confess our sins to one another and to hear the gospel spoken over our lives by others. Do we practice this, my dear friends? We can practice this if we have really been freed by the gospel. If we know that we have nothing to lose because we are united to Christ and we are clothed by his righteousness And I don't need to prove anything to anyone. And Christ abides in me. And he is revealing these things. And I can trust my brother or sister in whom also the same Christ is abiding. And be assured that I will be ministered by that. In Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 as a sobering reminder. It says, but exhort one another every day. As long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We need community to exhort one another every day to abide in Christ. 
You know, sometimes as immigrants, when we come to this country and you miss your loved ones back home, community can all just be about hanging together and doing cultural stuff. And we are afraid to go beyond that because we also come from a culture of faith saving and we haven't learned how to deal with conflicts. We are afraid of hurts. And so we keep closing our lives and moving away. And this pandemic has made us become more isolated than ever. And it is not good on the long run for us to thrive and spiritually, my dear friends. We need community. We need God's word. We need prayer. We need worship. We need community. These are all the basic things we need. We know we need them. But we need them because it is only through them we can experience our union with Christ. You know, there are times I've tried to fly a kite. It hasn't happened yet. It's because the wind is not there or it's not in the right direction or I don't even know how to do it. It's very, very frustrating. And it's embarrassing when I've tried it with my kids and they look at me and like my dad doesn't even know how to fly a kite. But when you do that, out of frustration, I can't blow enough air to create a wind that will lift my kite up. You know, sometimes it's possible for us to go overboard and put too much emphasis and significance on the means that we forget the person behind the means. There is a dangerous temptation of enthroning our experience of Christ over the real Christ, where we get focused on the reality of our experiences versus experiencing the reality. We place emphasis on the means as though they have the power to do something with an undue emphasis on prayer and say, you just have to pray more so we can get this or you have to believe more so this can happen. That's an abuse of the disciplines. There are times where God walks us through a desert and it may appear our prayers are not being answered. It may appear that when we read his word, we're not getting something. But those are times God is doing some deep work in drawing us closer to him. I'm going to speak more about that next week. And then lastly, there is one key to all these spiritual disciplines. And the key is consistency. It's not just doing once and taking a break and doing it after a while. You know, Anthony Trollope is a 19th century writer and he's written 47 novels. And this is a quote, he said, a small task if it be really daily, will beat the labors of a spasmodic Hercules. You know, what he means by that is over the long run, the unglamorous habit of repetition sparks creativity and adds to productivity. There are no spiritually disrupting silver bullets. I know we live in Silicon Valley and we love disrupting technologies. And we think we can have something like that to just make our spiritual lives amazing overnight. There isn't any. Our union with Christ happens slowly, invisibly, through the daily non-glamorous acts and moments in our time spent with his word, in our time spent in prayer, in our time spent in worship, in our time spent in community. And they all weave together to make Christ being formed in us. There's nothing glamorous about that. You know, there is an artist who has this quote which says, Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. If you're relying on this sudden bolt from lightning spiritual experience every day to keep you going, 
It's not happening, friends. It's in this daily, repetitive, consistent practice of spiritual disciplines will our union with Christ become bigger and bigger so Christ can be formed in us. And this is the season of Lent. There is no better time than now to get back to these basics and practice these disciplines with this new understanding we have of union with Christ. That we can pray and ask God to make Christ be formed in all areas of our lives this season. Let's pray.